Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. Joseph Butler in sermon number nine upon forgiveness of injuries is going to talk about how anger leads us astray and he's got a really great metaphor or analogy that he's using that of a distorting lens that he's, he's very committed to. He's going to exploit this uh, to maybe you could say it's full possible extent. And so before we jump into that, let's remind ourselves of something that Butler is committed to. Anger is a passion that was implanted in our human nature and we can use it properly. It does have some, you know, legitimate purposes or functions or ends. God gave it to us so that we can try to protect ourselves and those who matter to us and also to promote general benevolence to, you know, be good to other people. But anger does tend to mislead us and it doesn't do so just affectively in terms of how we feel, right? Or even just in terms of action, but also there's a very important point cognitively. So, you know, anger makes us judge things and assume things and infer things wrongly. And these are thoughts, not just feelings or desires, because the two of them are, you know, connected together. So early on in Sermon 9, he tells us, and he's got this, you know, great metaphor that many people have used. Um, he says that uh, this supposes every man in private cases to pass sentence in his own cause. So, you know, this is a, a, a problem that's acknowledged by many. If there's some sort of dispute between different people, you don't want one of the disputants to be made the judge right? uh, or to be the one who is calling all the shots. And then notice what else he says here. It, it, who is the judge? Uh, anger or resentment, the anger or resentment inside of you, not you as a whole, but the anger or resentment inside of you is the judge in these cases. And he says, well, the problem with this is that we're subject to numberless partialities. And what is a partiality? It's where we privilege or prioritize our own viewpoint, needs, desires over those of others that exist and, and should probably be on an equal plane for ourselves with our own. And so he goes on and he says, uh, from these numberless partialities, which we all have, everyone would often think himself injured when he was not. So this is one thing that we often get wrong. Did somebody actually do wrong to us? Not just did they harm us, but did they do what Butler is calling injury, which you could also translate as injustice. Did they, did they wrong us? Or did they just, you know, stumble against us and bump, right? So that's one thing that we get wrong. And then we also get wrong. If we are actually injured, well, how much? How, how much did they do to us? How bad is the thing that they're doing? And then I think we could also include, he doesn't talk about here that here directly in this passage, but if we read between the lines, whether they did it to us rightly, I mean, He's, he's talking about a context in which people get angry at other people for having gotten angry with them. So if I do something inconsiderate and careless and screw up somebody else's day and they get angry at me and then I get angry at them, I'm evaluating their own anger as if it's something against me that I don't deserve, right? And maybe I actually do deserve 
their anger. So whether they get angry at me rightly or not, I can be wrong about that. And our, our tendency to focus on ourselves and see things through our own matrix of needs, desires, assumptions, habits, and all that, that's what, what produces this problem. Uh, a little bit later, he's going to talk about self-love, and this will this will be where he actually talks about um, media or things that get in the way, but also mediate our looking at other things. So he says that self-love is a medium of a peculiar kind. It makes us look at things differently. How so? He says, in these cases, the cases of anger, it magnifies everything which is amiss in others. So that guy over there who's, you know, blowing his nose in a way that I don't like, he's doing something bad, right? Oh, look at that disgusting slob over there, right? And then when we do stuff, we tend to say, oh, it's everything is fine. I didn't intend anything bad. You know, what I'm doing is innocent. So we lessen everything amiss in ourselves. Butler is saying we're all subject to this distorting effect, this distorting cognitive effect, how we weigh what's going on, how we interpret other human beings' actions. And he also talks about um, a number of ways this happens. He says, uh, without knowing particulars, um, you know, I, I take upon me to assure all persons who think they've received indignities or injurious treatment that they may depend on it as in a manner certain the offense is not as great as they themselves imagine. We are in such a particular situation with respect to injuries done to ourselves that we can scarce any more see them as they really are than our eye can see itself. Our eye can't look at itself except maybe in a mirror, right? Or, I don't know, camera lens or something like that. Um, but, you know, he says, if we could actually place ourselves, as he calls it, at a due distance, that is be really unprejudiced, we would frequently discern that to be in reality inadvertence and mistake in our enemy, which we now fancy we see to be malice and scorn. So this shows us one of the, not just cognitive effects, but one of the possible cognitive remedies for the anger that we feel and experience. We could actually try to look at situations in a less prejudiced way. Can we be totally unprejudiced? Probably not, right? but we can certainly be more or less. And that way we can place ourselves at a due distance and say, well, how would somebody else, an impartial observer, regard what's being done here? And if we do that, maybe we won't get as angry. So that's some very interesting stuff about self-love, right? And then he tells us another thing Anger or hatred itself can be considered, as he says, as another false medium of viewing things. He also talks about a false light which anger sets things in. So we have two different and distinguishable sets of distortions going on. We have the self-love, which makes us more liable to take the things that other people are doing as reasons we should be angry with them once we actually are angry or if we've developed hatred in relation to that person, that is a second distorting effect. And what does that do? So anger tends to keep us stuck in the situation of feeling angry and aiming at retaliation. How does it do so? So he tells us that we represent characters and actions as much worse than they actually are. He says, ill will not only never speaks, but never thinks well of the person towards whom it is exercised. So the whole character and behavior is considered with an eye to that particular part which has offended us. The whole man appears monstrous without anything right or human in him. Whereas the resentment should surely at least be confined to that particular part of the behavior which gave offense, since the other parts of a person's life and character stand just the same as they did before. And he's, he's saying, well, 
you know, what does happen, we globalize. We, you could say, characterize. And we say, I know who that person is. They are all bad. <laughs> and so if we see them that way, then we can, you know, retaliate not just against the one thing that they did, but against who they are in general. You always do this sort of thing is that sort of refrain, right? And what is Butler trying to aim at here? This is where the metaphor of the lens, I think, is, is very, very helpful. He tells us that um, we want to make allowances for these sorts of things. And so he says it, it belongs just as much to bad people who will indulge the vice I'm arguing against as to good people who endeavor to subdue it in, in themselves to try to look at things let's call it more objectively, more impartially. When they get angry, they need to remind themselves that anger has this distorting effect. And so following out with this metaphor, he says all these cautions concerning anger and self-love are no more than desiring that a person who is looking through a glass, which either magnified or lessened, to take notice that the objects are not in themselves what they appear through that medium. So if you know that you're looking through a distorting medium, you can adjust for that. If you don't know that, well, then you assume that the reality is true. So being aware of the distorting effects that self-love has, and then the distorting effects that anger or hatred, once you're actually angry or hating somebody, also contributes to the mix, can be incredibly helpful for not going too far with your anger, not retaliating in the wrong way, not remaining angrier than you ought to be, and not globalizing about people or perhaps even going beyond that to entire groups of people and being angry or hateful towards them for the one offense that this person did here, which might not even be an injury in the first place. So these are some really helpful uh, reflections and arguments that are being provided here by Joseph Butler about how anger and self-love distort our views on things.